So stage is yours. Perfect, appreciate it. So welcome everybody. Uh, I hope to speak today in not more than 10 minutes because we have wonderful guests today, Herben Vieta and uh, Phil Beauvoir. And uh, I'll let you know in a second how we have, a, what the division of labor we have, what, uh, who is going to talk about. That is basically, uh, we have three topics today. A new product we have created, uh, we call it digital systems engineering process model. I'll just give you an idea how you can use it, how you can reach it and what for you can use it. And then I'll uh, give the word to Herben Vieta because uh, we don't want you to fall into a pitfall of overmodeling or analysis paralysis, whatever you call it. It has to be useful and meaningful, the product we're giving you. And last but not least, we're going to have an interview, I would say a short interview with uh, one of the authors of the Archi tool. We'll uh, say a couple of words about that later. Heroes of today's webinar, Jean-Baptiste, if, if you'll find uh, the way to share your video, if you want to, please do so now. These are the pictures of us. That's how we look uh, like in the normal day, uh, normal life. No, I'm just kidding. That's the mid-journey impression of us as uh, heroes. And uh, I have to say why I picked these uh, these way to, to, to show us. Um, well, to me, the, the cooperation, collaboration of today is really like, uh, if you watch Marvel movies, it's like uh, one of these movies when all of these heroes from different movies come together and do something like Avengers. And I'm really happy we have all of us today. I would like just to ask Herben, Phil and Jean-Baptiste uh, say hello to the audience. They will have all their stages except Jean-Baptiste probably because he's traveling. Herben, please say a couple of words. Where are you now? What do you do? And hello to the audience. Um, well. Um... Um, actually, in the picture here, I look like kind of a Bond villain, and Phil looks, and, and Jean Baptiste looks uh, like the hero. Uh, Phil as the, well, I don't know what to make of that. But anyway, um, uh, I work for uh, my day job, which is uh, where I draw all my inspiration or most of my inspiration is at APG All Pensions Group. We manage about six hundred billion euros of pension money for about four and a half million people in collective pension funds. And I'm the lead architect for the shared IT services organization, which means that I'm deep in uh, technology as, a, as an enterprise architect. Next to that, um, I can't stop writing, which means that uh, I write a blog and I've written a couple of books. One of those is about Archimate, but today I'm going at the request of Alexander, say something about my other book, which is a very small book. It's called Chess and the Art of Enterprise Architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Herben. Phil, a couple of words from your side. Okay, hi everyone. I'm uh, Phil Beauvoir, um, and I'm the co-creator of the software which we're about to discuss. And I'm trying to avoid to say its name so that we can discuss on how to pronounce the name of the software. <laughs> um, I co-produced the software with um, Jean Baptiste Saradi, yeah. who's also on the call, um, and I hope today to answer some questions from Alexander in a kind of uh, Q&A session um, where he will grill me on, on, on the software and its uptake. Thank That's you, it. thank you. Appreciate it. Jean-Baptiste, if you like, drop a couple of words. Yes, I don't know if you can see me because uh, for some security reasons, yeah, perfect. So um, uh, I'm an enterprise architect uh, at BNP Paribas. Um, so I'm basically worked during the past six years uh, working on, uh, on um, operational risk management and, uh, and procurement and, uh, and superior risk management. So all those kind of topics. And I'm moving um, uh, at this time to a new position inside BNP and I will be in charge of frameworks and trainings for the global architecture teams at, uh, at BNP. And um, uh, Phil said uh, he, he was a co-creator of um, the, the software. We won't pronounce the name. Uh, and in fact, I would say that he is the creator of this software. And uh, I have the, the opportunity to contribute. Uh, so I, I would mostly see me as a kind of, um, I would say, maybe product owner trying to find the direction and the feature set that we want to, to add. But uh, Phil has to take uh, all the credits for this uh, tool. And uh, last and maybe not least, uh, I have the chance to be the chair of the Archimate Forum inside the Open Group. And uh, I've been so for the past uh, 
six years now, or seven, almost seven. So, so basically, Archimate and uh, and this tool are my life. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate that you're there again. And now I hope the audience can feel why I feel like we're having an Avengers movie. So let's proceed. Let's proceed. Uh, let me give you an idea for those of you who are not from the Incusi community. So there is a community of systems engineers. We call ourselves systems engineers. And Incusi is the nonprofit organization which unites us. It's International Council for Systems Engineering. And these GFSE letters mean a chapter of this uh, international community, a German one. It's Gesellschaft für Systems Engineering. And the product we're talking about today is a process model. So like uh, every respectful discipline, we have our process model, which we think uh, the, that's the list of processes which have to be executed in order to create a successful system. Let me put it like that briefly. And there is a pretty much large book about that called Incosi Systems Engineering Handbook, which basically gives you insights not only on inputs, outputs, and activities within these processes, but also about methods. I mean, how you can execute these processes, what specific methods there exist. And there is an ISO standard which contains inputs, outputs, process description. And as you can imagine, before I go further, that's not the only one thing systems engineering as a discipline consists of. We have a lot of really different interesting things and basically every other discipline, well, respectful discipline has a process model, or well, probably not every, but that's not a unique feature of systems engineering. The unique one probably is the systems approach or system thinking, how you can call it. And that's the thing which has to be applied every time if you want to do some systems engineering things that's probably the most important one but we're not going to talk about that today i just want to give you some awareness that's the systems engineering is not about processes only that's an important part of it but that's not only it no and now um we go further the product itself let me just give you an idea there are two parts of that and I will go right to the presentation of these two parts. What is it about? Uh, first things first, I mentioned that this process model I'm talking about is originally in a handbook. That's basically a 300 pages long book. And you can imagine it's really difficult to have all the information about the process model at the same time on your fingertips because you have to scroll the PDF file or turn pages to find out how these or that process is related to each other. That's basically what we fix with the process model. And I will go to incozy.org slash process model. That's the web address everybody can access. Everybody, everyone with internet access, with any device with internet access can open it. That's the core part. That's basically the landing page of our product. This fancy animation just shows you how that's that's a process model actually, like a digitized visualization. How fancy it looks like entities and relationships between uh, between them. The orange one uh, are processes, the green ones are inputs and outputs. And if you want to try it, you just click this button. Then you go to this. We call it interactive process model. You cannot really change anything here, but you, you can navigate through it. And that's basically how it works. This is the familiar process model. These are the processes and you can click through it. You can get the description of a process and you can go a bit, you have a reference if you want detailed description of that in the handbook, you open it right away on the page you need. And if you like, you can go deeper see the activities in the process and you that's where we make a cut we don't we don't go deeper so if you want to see the description of these activities you go to the handbook and if you want to do, see the description of the methods which you might use to execute this process you go to the handbook and there are inputs and outputs which you have the definition of just to click through them and that's basically how it works just to um, give you an idea that that's not a fancy picture, not something you can create in video or any other 
drawing tool, I would say. There is a database behind this thing. And you can feel that because there is a there is a way to ask SQL queries to these uh, to this database. Like I'll just ask a simple one, and then it'll give you a table of contents which we have behind it. And that table will bring me to a second part of our product. You actually can download a model and change it, work with that, or how, how we call it, tailor it to improve your enterprise, to adapt it to your enterprise, or to adapt your enterprise to it, depending on what's going on with your enterprise. What you see now is technically an export, something what we exported from a tool, which name we won't call till the end of the webinar, but I will show you the tool, just to give you a feeling uh, that there is a database behind it. I'll open another tool just to show you the visualization of the database. Again, that's what you've seen on the animation on the landing page. And that's basically entity relationships of the database we have. Orangey, orange ones are the processes. The size of it means how many relations this or that process has to any neighboring entities. And the green ones are the inputs and outputs. And that's a real database. There are relations between things. And you can imagine you can work with that in the model-based manner. I'll go to the tool, which we used for that. And that's basically it. That's the tool. Uh, and that's the model I was talking about. It looks pretty much the same way but it's editable. You can move these things and these things are related to each other, as I said. And before I give a word to, to Gabon, to Herben, I'd like to give you an idea how you can use it, except you just can split processes, merge processes and something. Imagine that you have a department which deals with these three ones, validation, verification, and integration. And you want to tailor this process model according to what's happening in your organization. And it would be really great if you could have created one single picture which contains inputs and outputs and these three processes. Well, that's what you can do with a model if you have a model. For instance, for this tool, you can generate a view, uh, a name and architecture definition for uh, graphic. And you will get this one automatically. It looks pretty much messy, but if you spend about five minutes with that, and this is nothing compared to what you have done with a book, scrolling the pages, that will look like that. And that is pretty much nice thing. You can work with that. No, these are these three processes. These are inputs and outputs between these processes. And that's the thing. And the last question you might ask, uh, how you can change the reality with this model? Well, one of the examples you can do, you can generate a PowerPoint of that if you don't want to use a tool and go with this PowerPoint to engineers who actually execute these processes. They probably call them differently. That's the automatically generated PowerPoint without any tweaks and tricks. It's just the out of the box uh, template you can use. And you go and talk with these engineers who do these jobs and try to find out if they recognize these inputs and outputs. This way you can find gaps with them and these engineers, the subject matter experts can tell you, oh, that's an interesting idea. I'm probably missing this thing in my work. Let us try to implement that in future projects. That's a good way to apply this model-based approach to change your organization and to tailor your process model. Because after you did this work with engineers, you gather this information, you update the model and probably make some decisions for uh, organizational development. And that will give me an opportunity to jump or to switch to Kerpen in, in a minute because the bad way to use it, I want to, again, uh, warn you from uh, falling into pitfall of overmodeling. You can say, okay, I'll just create model of an organization and the engineers will be informative probably. I will come by to them wearing white shirts. I don't have anything against white shirt. I have uh, I have one, uh, I'm wearing one uh, on my own, but that is, that's a real example. There was an engineering department with engineers dealing with a part of a car, let's say, and some smart guys came to them 
I've, I've shown them a process model, not this one, but a similar one, and said, OK, let's try to tweak it. They spent a little time with these engineers. They went back and changed something in the model. And it lasted for a while. And then engineers got some kind of manual or process description, which should have helped them. And myself, I was helping these engineers on their level. And I asked them, OK, now you have this process description, the model which somebody created for you. Can it really help you? Does it influence your work anyhow? And the engineer, he said, no, not at all. And that is exactly what we don't want to do with this model. And we want to prevent you from over analysis and over modeling. And that is the point when I stop my presentation and would like to give uh, a word, a stage to uh, Herben. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. I'm going to share my screen. And you can see my screen now, if all right. Can you? No, not yet. Oh, not yet. OK, wait. Share. Yes, now it is. OK. OK. So now. If all is well, you can see the first slide, right? Yes. OK, then I'll start off now. OK, uh, thank you very much. I had the feeling I was something like, uh, say, uh, the entertaining break between two serious uh, stories. Um, uh, because, of course, I'm not going to talk about modeling, and I'm not going to talk about all the serious work with, uh, with processes, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, Alexander asked me to give kind of a very short overview of uh, not my modeling book, but the other book, is, which is called Chess and the Art of Enterprise Architecture, and try to do that in a very short time. Normally, uh, the, uh, it takes me three, uh, three times as much, so I'm going to go a bit quick, and I'm going to let this up for about one second so people can stop, look at it later. This is about me, um, and this is also about me. The only thing I really have to say is anything I say here is my own view, right? I'm not talking on behalf of APG here. Um, not everybody at APG always agrees. You all, we all have that experience, right? You work in an organization, there is constant discussion. It's, it's the same for me. So uh, let's jump into it. Why did I actually write that book? Um, and the, the reasons for those were as long as I was in enterprise architecture and you would, could say that's something from around 20 years ago. Uh, I had experience that all the formal frameworks I ran into were, in, in my experience, almost useless. Um, and why were they useless? And, and Alexander rightly uh, kind of focuses on something has to be useful to be meaningful, right? Um, first, whatever people did in enterprise architecture, I could not see an effect on the real landscape, right? So. You had all this ivory tower stuff with, with either a lot of details or not a lot of details and pictures, etc. But on the on the shop floor, nothing really changed. People did what they had to do. Um, and there were all kinds of big frameworks uh, like FEAF and, and, and others, which if you wanted to execute them in full, um, it was impossible, right? You, you would need an army of people doing that and you will be doing a lot of things and not really producing a lot. And so as a result was my observation was that the average lifespan of an enterprise architecture initiative was about two to three years, right? Um, people start, they are really enthusiastic, new shiny new pictures are being presented. And at the end, uh, after two years, everybody says, yeah, yeah, what, what, had it had, what has it actually delivered us? Not much. So we reorganize and the whole story starts again. So in 2010, I started writing, but then in 2011, I got the chance to set up enterprise architecture in the way I, I thought it should be. It was kind of a greenfield situation. And that period ended in 2014. So I built a team and I put in all the practice, et cetera. And then I wrote the book. And the big advantage was that not everything worked what I did. So I actually could also write a chapter on the hurdles and the things that went wrong and the things that I learned it. So it's a very kind of a, it's also kind of a story about what went wrong, what, what worked, what did not work. Um, so in summary, the formal frameworks I met were almost completely useless, meaningless, no effect. The chaos remained, whatever amount of enterprise architecture people were doing and nobody was actually really satisfied. 
So why did I use chess as an analogy? And I came up with that somewhere around 2013 with talking to somebody who did not know what it was all about. And the reason I use chess is more or less because it works, because most people you could talk with are somewhat familiar with chess. They at least understand the game is unpredictable for each player. And they also understand that it's really complex, right? So it's not really easy to kind of um, calculate the result. So in my view, the orthodox enterprise architecture is based on a couple of assumptions that are suspect. If you ask me, they are wrong. Uh, but by looking at those assumptions in the chess setting, I could actually illustrate what was happening. So there are, there are about four major assumptions or parts of classic enterprise architecture that are the focus. The first one is that everybody in enterprise architecture works with the future state, right? So the, you have your current state, you have the future state, the gap analysis. Uh, Jeannie Ross has written a whole book on it that that's the way you do enterprise architecture and most frameworks work like this. Now, the interesting thing is that the key elements in your landscape have an average lifespan of about 15 years and the average lifespan of your uh, company strategy is about four. Uh, and not only that, but um, you cannot actually predict, you cannot actually move towards that end state. Every year uh, you have to change that because things have changed in your environment. So that future state, which you might reach say five, six, seven years from now, never comes to pass. And it actually doesn't really help. People put in there what they already were planning. It doesn't have an, an influence. The second thing was that people tend, in, in enterprise architecture mainly, they tend to actually do a lot of abstraction and totally ignore details. Details, we're not about technology, right? We're not about details. We're not about stuff. But you actually fail because of the details. So um, there is this Chinese saying that people stumble across molehills. Not, they stumble not uh, uh, over mountains. They stumble over molehills. So if you want to do enterprise architecture, for me, that meant that you should not ignore the details, but you should have some way of finding the relevant details. The third one was really something everybody likes. That's architecture principles. Put in a couple of rules. If you kind of follow those rules, those are at least sound and those are the right things to do. And in my experience, they tended to be toxic. Um, they were especially toxic when they were followed, when it was a really bad idea to follow them. And this happened. I've seen a large government project where I was closely related to at that time of 150 million uh, euros completely fail because they followed an architecture principle which they should not have. Um, and the fourth one is that if I thought about what architects should really do, that is, if you don't do anything that has an effect on the shop floor where the actual design decisions are being made, everything you do is useless. You have nice pictures, you have a happy uh, board of directors, and they all think everything is going swimmingly. But, the, but if you don't affect the real landscape, it's useless what you do, and you will be reorganized every three years. So back to chess, um, you don't win a chess game by trying to get to a specific end situation on the board, right? Um, the, the exact end result of a move in chess is unpredictable. What you do is not talk about, well, I'm going to work towards a situation that his king is here, his pawn is there, my queen is there, and it's checkmate. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes a pawn move or a pawn position may win or lose you the game, right? Details count. You're not only talking about the queen, you're talking about pawns. Pawns are very important, but not all pawns all the time. And what is an important uh, thing I could use as an analogy was you cannot win a chess game by following simple tactical rules. They are toxic. And I must explain that. When my son learned chess, and he was about, about six or seven or something, he said, well, what's, what's a good move then? And I told him, and I said, well, yeah, that's what the game is about. But I can give you a starting point. So I said, there is a simple rule you can use. Um, you give each piece, you give uh, uh, a number. Queen is nine. Rook is five, bishop three, knight three, pawn one. And if you do an exchange of material and you get more points than you give away, that's a good exchange. You have one material. 
However, if you blindly follow that rule, take every offer of winning material, are you going to win the game? No, you don't, because it's much more complex than that. And actually, tripping people up by trying to give them an advantage, which looks like an advantage, is a common thing in chess. So following a rule when it's a bad idea, you can't do these difficult decisions just by simply following simple rules. And here is what chess masters do. They don't look at a future state, what they are in the here and now. And every time they make a decision, a change in the landscape, a move, they look at how does this affect my robustness? How does it affect my opportunities? How does it, this affect my agility, et cetera, et cetera. Gary Kasparov has once said, I, I think about three to five moves ahead. And people think that chess masters think many, many moves ahead, which is not true. They actually uh, have a, a kind of a, a feel for where to look at the board, which is quite different from calculating. And there is more, because actually, if you look at chess, chess is extremely simple, right? We have a perfectly knowable current state on a small board of 64 clearly separated areas. We have only six types of pieces. And we have two very polite players taking turns in making a move. Now compare that to the enterprise. In the enterprise, we have hundreds, maybe thousands of overlapping areas, all kinds of processes and functions and people doing roles and whatever. We have hundreds of types of pieces. And we have tens or hundreds of moves, like changes in the landscape, made concurrently by tens and hundreds of players. So if you look from an enterprise architecture perspective, the board changes while you are making a move, which means that you have to wonder why do people believe in principles, future states, and ignoring details and other simplistic ideas if it doesn't even work in something as simple in chess and they think you can actually make that work in something as complex as a large organization. And the reason for that is it's very seductive. So it's seductive because it's what we can do. And I have to speed it up a little bit. So we know that we cannot do it, so we are overwhelmed. And we kind of go back to what is doable. For me, the enterprise architecture orthodoxy is kind of a flight reaction to complexity and not a fight reaction. You can move into enterprise architecture and, and be about with a couple of simple boxes and lines and et cetera, and you're doing your work. The problem is you're not fighting complexity, you're fleeing from uh, uh, complexity. So the important elements is first, remember, architecture is the aspects that are difficult to change. Second is nobody can know everything of everything. So you have to collaborate with people who actually know things, right? You and for that, I use consent-based decision-making. And the best IT architects, I'm going to tell you all, this is about software system engineers here, right? You guys are the, are the people who actually create the architecture, not the enterprise architectures with their lines and boxes at the top of the organization. So the most important thing is actually to harness the power of the engineers that understand the complexity and understand what is going on in the real world. I kind of like talking with engineers. Um, so it's architecture is finding out what is hard to change and then making sure that those changes you make are very healthy changes. Uh, note, by the way, that IT is actually petrifying organization societies. It's getting harder and harder to change our landscapes We're all, because they are getting bigger and bigger in the, uh, all kinds of interdependencies, change something here, it breaks something there. In fact, we are not heading towards a singularity point. We're actually, in my view, heading towards a complexity crunch. And fighting off that moment that it's getting harder and harder to change is actually the name of the game. So for me, four points of strategy, if you look at strategy, and that is true for a platform, for an organization, for everything. First is you look at what am I forced to do? For an organization, often, if the law changes, you have to follow the law, otherwise you're out of business. These are the things you're forced to do. The second one is the one we always look at, that's backcasting. We want to go there, how do we get there? That's your kind of desired future state, right? Um, most of the time, these are lumped together in a single category. This is where we want to go. But there's a third one, and really mature organizations do this, 
That is, you look at your uncertainties. What are the things I have to uh, take to into account which are not certain and the design decisions I make have to be robust under that uncertainty. And the last one is actually new. That one is your strategic agility. That is, you're not just executing a strategy. I asked one of our board members once, I said, do you want the IT people to kind of nail and screw and glue you to your current strategy? And she said to me, no, I don't. So I said to her, well, you have to tell them because if I tell them, they say, who are you? If you tell them only the strategy and you don't tell them that you're going to change that strategy four years from now, they are going to, to kind of super glue you to your current strategy. And in four years time, when you want to change your strategy, you're kind of glued to your current strategy. What's in there? That's an attention to life cycle management, very boring things, technical debt, making sure that you're actually be able to move because it's not in my view, more and more is architecture, not about executing a strategy. It's about actually trying to make sure that when your strategy changes, you can execute it. It's about not getting fixed by IT to your current norms and values and state. So that was it, 14 minutes, 25 seconds. Elvin, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for that. And guys, I encourage you to ask questions like to the product. It's obviously a really cool thing, which we did, but I would like to point your attention at the fact that we have our guests and it will be really uh, interesting to talk to them because I always can answer your questions uh, because you will always be able to contact me. Let me give a short recap first uh, about what I said, because that's probably one of the things I missed, but two parts of the product, and both of them you can always access using this link. Just note it in cozy.org slash process minus model. One thing, why I asked another one, well, except what I said before, why I asked Herben to uh, tell us what he said, uh, the process model is uh, a template for organizations. We as systems engineers usually deal with products, like technical stuff, in some cases services. But as far as we know what systems thinking or systems approach is, we can switch our focus to different things and let us switch the focus to organization or how, as we call it, enabling system for a product. The product, sorry for this pun, the process model, which we digitized is a template for an organization. Now that's why we're talking about enterprise architecture or architecture of organizations. And I really encourage you, even if your main focus on the daily business is a product, to think about the enabling system for one obvious reason. If you want to improve your product, you have to improve your enabling system or organization. That works this way. You cannot make better products until you create the better organization before. That's the Conway law. Uh, there are many ways or metaphors how to call it, but that's the thing. Um, short summary, uh, well, there is no summary about what Herman said in this slide, but if you want to uh, uh, look into details what uh, Herman wrote in the book, there is the book, you can easily uh, buy it. Uh, there is another book Herman mentioned that we were not talking about that today, Mastering Archimate. That's another one, really great reading if you're dealing with enterprises as your system of interest. And Herman writes really interesting articles. You can see uh, to take a look at them on his blog pretty much easily. If you want, though, more collaboration between Incusi Systems Engineering Society and Enterprise Engineering Society, or specifically with Herben, then write it in chat now, or better in question and answer sections, uh, uh, or just write me an email, because I think that's really the collaboration which will help us. We as systems engineers tend to deal with products, enterprise architects tend to deal with enterprises, and that's the synergy. No, that's how we can work together. Good. So guys, uh, we're going to make a smooth transition 
to um, question and answer section, and I will start, I will allow myself to start that with a short interview of uh, Phil Bouvard. Uh, we didn't prepare any, prepare any presentations about the tool, but as I said, and that's another one mighty thing, as I said, you can download uh, the process model. It's in an editable form, and you can try to edit it right now. We provide various formats, the simplest one to import anyways, CSV format. There is more formal one, the XML file in the open exchange format. But the simplest way to try it right away is to download the tool and uh, download the file, which we provide as well, open it in the tool and try to change it, try to play with it, try to pretend to be an enterprise architect modeler, if you like. So, uh, Phil, before I ask, well, let us start with the simplest thing. How do you pronounce that? How do we pronounce the name of the software? Well, it's yes. interesting, isn't it? Because we have architecture, we have Archimate, so you would assume Archi, which, of course, is the correct pronunciation in Europe. But for me, it's Archie, which is because the code name for the um, code name for the software as well as developing it had to have a name and it was a boy's name which is Archie with an E on the end so and then somebody said well we'll just get rid of the E and we'll call it Archie so is this it's your choice if you want to call it Archie please do but I always call it Archie because it's quite a fond name like a like a child's name okay so that is it's no my, right. my child you know oh, okay I got it uh, let's switch to, to you, because as we know, enabling system is more important as the system of interest. Um, uh, I know you're, you're in the UK, right? Yeah. I wonder, how, how did you decide even to do something like Archie? For what reason? What was the trigger? Okay, well, 13 years ago, I was working um, as a software developer or researcher at a UK university. And... Um, the department I worked in was involved in promoting open standards, uh, open standards to do mainly with e-learning, things like metadata, uh, learning design and so forth. But there came a point in 20, around 2010, no, 2009, quite a long time ago, where they started, universities, UK universities started to get interested in uh, business modeling and enterprise architecture, which enterprise architecture was a fairly new thing for everyone in those days, and um, particularly with Archimate. And at that time, um, universities wanted to get involved with Archimate, but the only existing tools at the time were proprietary tools, which were quite expensive. And so they said, well, you know, we have to put our money where our mouth is we're into open standards perhaps we could get um an open a simple open implementation of the archimate language in a software tool and we know just the superhero who can do this which was me at the time and they said well phil we've got six months of funding can you come up with something on this archimate language which no one knows about and i said of course i can Ugh. You know, it's like uh, chess and the art of software development, isn't it? Ah, now I'm made myself into a checkmate almost. Um, so I said, yeah, okay, I'll have a go at it. And after six months, in June 2010, I released the version 1.0 of Archie software, which was very basic. You could draw boxes and you could draw lines with it colored boxes and colored lines. And um, and th that was really my understanding of what was required. 13 years later, I have a, think I have a better understanding of what is required and the complexity of enterprise architecture and Archimate and other languages like this has meant that the software has evolved considerably since those days to become something that is used um, quite a lot throughout the world. We have several downloads and um, several users who are now using this tool. So um, that's that's how it got started and here we are today. Yeah, uh, by the way, about here, or just uh, make a recap for all the guys who don't know that Archimate 
is a language. It's like an architecture modeling language. We're not talking about that deeper, but that's the language which Archie as a tool supports. You know? That's a formal architecture development language with a pretty much specific ontology model or grammar as Herbin calls it, a kind of railway for thinking, but that's not the topic of our presentation for today. Uh, Phil, you said, and now we are here. Uh, where are we here? How would you uh, drop us some numbers? How many downloads you have from what parts of the world? Just like uh, several ones, if you have them. Well, I'm going to share the screen. Can can I do this? I think so. Yes, I think so. Okay, I'll try the uh, sharing my desktop. Yes, it is. is. Can you see my Can you see my desktop? Yes. Okay, um, we can see the Archie tool here. Um, and I think you previously showed a screenshot of it in your presentation, Alexander, as well, didn't you? And in fact, you were also showing one of the HTML reports that was generated by the, exactly. by the Archie tool. But if I switch over to um, Firefox, oh, here, by the way, this is the Archie website. If you wanna go and download the tool, we should actually point out that the tool is free. And True. this is something that we should consider if, if you're gonna ask me the question of why is Archie so popular? Well, okay, everyone likes free stuff, I think probably is, is one of the things. Okay, so getting back to the question of how many downloads we're seeing from Archie or how popular it is, um, I do keep, I do track, um, wow. There are, this isn't, show, this page isn't showing the downloads, this is showing the popularity by country. And we can see that Russia is, is quite a, a popular, well, the most popular country for downloading. Two and a half thousand downloads of Archie every week. Now, that's quite a lot. That's up nine, between nine and 10,000 downloads every month. And those figures are not um, bots downloading it because I've set up the websites so that I can track on actual physical clicks. Uh, that's a lot of people when you think about it. And I don't know why there are that many people, but um, Archimate is big in certain countries, as we can see, Russia, Netherlands, um, France, obviously due to the um, influence of uh, Jean-Baptiste Saradi. Um, so why is it so popular? Um, as I said earlier, when we first started with the software, the only way you could download to get um, download Archimate tools was through expensive proprietary software. Archie is free. Archie is open source. And if there's something that it doesn't do and you want to scratch an itch, we also have a scripting language so that you can uh, create your own workflow or add some feature through the what we call the JArchie scripting language. Um, it also adheres to the open groups open exchange format, which is an open format for exchanging Archimate models between one tool and another tool. Uh, we have a Git-based collaboration repository plugin as well. So because it's open, because it's extensible, because it's free, we can continue to develop it. And I must say that it's not just me who's worked on this. Um, Jean-Baptiste Saradi, who was with us earlier in the in the uh, presentation, who's unfortunately had to leave to catch a train, is also my partner in crime when it comes to developing Archie. Where I guess we're a bit like Lennon and McCartney. Um, you know, you know, you can't have one without the other. Perfect, perfect. Just last thing, let me ask you that briefly before I jump to the question and answers, because I don't want to ask all the questions myself. Have you ever met John Baptiste in person because he's in France, you're in the UK? Well, I think he, I don't think he exists. I think he was <laughs> an avatar. I've never, no, I have seen him in real life. Yes, we have met uh, in several times um, in uh, meetings hosted by the Open Group. By the way, the Open Group are the is the organization that um how should we say looks after or or takes the the archimate standard and promotes it and develops it um so yes um we we have met um and uh we, we i think we make a good team perfect perfect got it 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just switching to the questions and answers, like what uh, audience asked. I'm definitely going to find something for you, so don't leave. Uh, again, thank you very much for being there. Herben, Phil, and uh, Jean-Baptiste, he doesn't hear us anymore, but still, I really appreciate that you were there. And we're still there. And I do hope that at some point in time, probably next year, we'll see, in Kuzi, conference or workshop or something will be a platform where we can come together and discuss enterprise architecture. Anyway, so let's take a look at the questions which we have from the audience. Great product, for some reason in quotes, it is a product. Uh, Jake, uh, I assume it's a German and Jakob Koch uh, Meinthusen uh, asks us, uh, great product, will it be updated to reference again future systems engineering handbook version five? Yes. As soon as guys release that, there will be a fifth version of the handbook. Now it's based, the product is based on the fourth one. We'll update that, I think, till the end of the year. As far as I recall, the handbook is going to be published in the middle of the year. But anyways, it will be definitely. Uh, by the way, if you want to attend uh, at the update of the product, write me an email. That's an easy thing to do. Uh, Mohammed Haif, uh, Haifawi, I do hope I pronounce your surname properly. Uh, hello, I have a few questions. Is this model design based on the model-based systems engineering? And, uh, well, I would. <laughs> Alexander, don't, don't, uh, please don't answer all the questions. Give yeah, yeah. your, give uh, your, okay. hero, give your heroes a chance to pick a question, I guess. Uh, yeah. Got it, got it. No, it's... Uh, thanks for the note. Let, let's go with the last one I, I picked. And then, guys, if you want to ask uh, to answer any question in the Q&A on your own, just interrupt me. So it well, is for more to answer the questions, uh, uh, say, in the Q&A. So. Uh, What's that? I've been trying to answer the question in the Q&A. So ah, I like in the chat. Yeah. yeah. No, you should please read the question and answer it. Uh, you can do that I, right now. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. would appreciate this way just because it's communication uh, all right okay uh well i can take one yeah um uh, let's see there was uh, somebody asked me um if if enterprise architecture can be taught which is a very old question of course because already plato wrote about what can be taught and what cannot be taught um, for me, enterprise architecture and solution architecture are not that different. They are very different in scope, but not so much in what you have to do. That's making healthy de decisions for the future. And those are decisions about the things that will be hard to change later. Um, can it be taught? No, I, I never would hire somebody who comes from, say, a, an architecture university or an education or whatever. I would always look at and talk with them about have they actually experienced complexity? and unpredictability and how have they managed that and what have they done and what kind of decisions have they learned from etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, yes it's something that grows on you right um, personally for me the best architects are the ones who never have lost their connection with technology uh, if you make your best technology guy the architect and he doesn't do anything anymore it's use it or lose it and three years from now he will he will be a millstone about your neck so you have to keep up with technology to be a good enterprise architect uh, at least that's my view got it thank you uh phil if you catch any question from yeah. the q and a uh, i got a really easy one from okay. carl stokes is the tool archie open source and the simple answer, of course, yes, and free. By the way, you can, you can support us on Patreon if you want. Guys, I encourage to do that because yeah. I'm a proud, proud Patreon supporter of uh, Phil and John Baptiste. Yes, uh, you. obviously your decision, but yeah, I really yeah. like the tool and I support guys when they do something cool, not only John Baptiste and Phil. Yeah. Uh, just to finish the last one, uh, it is meant to be used as model-based systems engineering of enterprises, but do not stick to this term. The idea is to make your actions meaningful, no? that I'm addressing what Herbin said today. That's a tool which helps you to get the knowledge from the process model, which is written in the handbook, and to apply that to change the reality and to make people at the end of the day happier. No, that's what it is for. 
uh, I see several questions. If you can access, access all of that, guys, that's an important one in cozy.org slash process dash model. That's the landing page. You get everything from there, both interactive one, which I clicked, and the downloadable files, which I had open in the tool Archie. Everything is available for you right now. Just try it. Alexander, if you want. Alexander the, the link is in the chat. Don't worry. Perfect. Appreciate that, Christian. Thank you. So I, I'm happy to hear, by the way, if you didn't notice that uh, there was a voting, I mean, the presenters didn't notice that, obviously, but there was a voting if we want to have more collaboration with Herben, and there was a lot of yes answers. Herben, I think you will have to report at some point of time. <laughs> yeah, good. I, I'm really happy that we have this enterprise architecture and systems engineering collaboration. Phil, Jean Baptiste, that will be obviously great to have you all in the same room at some point of time. We have 27 questions open. Let's focus on. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I can answer this one. There is a question about combining Archimate and SysML. No, I don't have experience with that. I have experience with Archimate and UML, uh, which we both use in the organization. And UML is really a very um, nice language to for uh, software architecture, right? For all the kind of different things you can do. You have all these different views. Actually, Archimate has only one view, but has different elements. And UML has actually all these different views. They can exist side by side. I would use Archimate for landscape, right? That's the that's the thing I do in Archimate, um, and 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 not the the software engineering stuff. Thank you. By the way, Eric, I think it's a good place where you can try to uh, <clears throat> give your input. Incozy is a nice platform to try to merge that on that specific example, which you will find in the real life. So come by, join the working group, and we'll do that. Phil, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I can see a question. Um, from Matt Hockenbrock, and the question is, is there a simple export or built-in connection between Archie and Gephi? And the answer is, I don't know, but all things are possible. This gets back to what I was saying earlier, that if you can export the data from Archie in some common format, there's no reason why you then can't import it or present it in another format like this. So I'd say, yes, it's possible, but I don't know if anyone's done it yet. Guys, that's what you have seen, and I assume that's the reason you ask the question. Uh, these fancy visualization with bubbles of different color, that was from Gephi. And that's basically the CSV export from Archie and import in Gephi. Nothing more, nothing less. It was more or less like that. It might be useful, it might be useful here to mention that Archimate uh, has a standard exchange form. That's right. True. True. The open exchange format, yes. Good. Uh... I can make a critical remark on that too. That is, all the software developers for Archimate test their open exchange models generally only with their own tool, which means that it really works well for export import in their own tool. But if you go from one tool to the other, yeah. it sometimes run into the fact that underwater, one tool just works somewhat differently and needs some other parts of the model. Uh, so um, uh, so it's it's not perfect, but actually it is usable. Yeah, I mean, we, we could expand on that um, for hours uh, uh, <laughs> about the usefulness or not usefulness of the open Archimate XML format. And the problem is, is because every tool has a different way of presenting graphics, boxes, lines, joining, all this kind of stuff. And I this, is not specified in the Archimate specification. No, That's but one thing is I, I use the exchange model because I stopped using the graphics from the tool I use. Yeah. I use the exchange model and then I have programmed because, you know, always once an engineer, always an engineer, I've programmed something like 6,000 6, lines of code yeah. to read the exchange model and turn that into really nice graphics. Yeah. Um, so not as nicely moving as the ones from Alexander, but uh, still, if you look at the details, uh, then uh, really nice things are going on there. And I use the exchange model format for that. 
Yeah. Let's 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 go to a serious question. What question, uh, Alexandra? What question can we make about using the proposed process model to real R and D projects? Can I mention I can use uh, it as taxonomy for knowledge management to talk to tag documents, for example? Maybe there's more. Uh, there's more I am missing. I assume that's the question from the onto, uh, knowledge management and ontologies working group from the Incusi. That's another use case. You can try to map your organizational knowledge to these processes, but basically, first of all, you have to tailor the process model to something meaningful for your organization, because seldom organization understand, organizations understand this language, like validation, verification, tricky for them. Make it understandable for your people and then map knowledge to that. Christian, if you allow me, there is one question which uh, I think actually Herben would have uh, answered, but uh, uh, what's the best way to start with Archie and how to learn the language? The best way to start with Archie is to download the tool, archimatetool.com, to learn the language. Um, it has this standard which describes it, but that's not the way I did it. I really recommend you to go to Herben's webpage and download Mastering Archimate. It has huge amount of templates, like real life examples modeled with Archimate with extremely clear explanation, why this way, why that way, why not that way. That's how I learned it. And that helps me really a lot. Just, just yeah. one thing, the book is a commercial thing, but the first uh, part of it, which explains the entire standard in a more didactic way is a free download. Yes, so about, you can even take 50, the excerpt free. About 50 pages. Yes. The rest is me droning on about patterns. Perfect. Uh, a mix of uh, English and German in the tool. Guys, there shall be no uh, mixture between German and English. I'll allow myself to switch to uh, sharing of the screen briefly. So that's basically the process model. And that is in English, as you, as you see. If you see some German words, write me, it has to be fixed. But what uh, Phil mentioned, you can uh, script something in the, in, the, in the model and ask the tool to execute these scripts. And that's basically what we did. Every of these objects has properties and uh, we have German translation of the handbook and we have German translation of the whole product. And if you download it and you download the script no, you can execute the script, which asks the tool switch these properties, and then suddenly it becomes German. This tool yes. is amazing. Yes, <laughs> this tool. Yes, <laughs> thank you for commenting on. Well, that. actually, the truth of it is, the uses to which it's put are amazing. You know, it's people you. people get very very clever with the scripting stuff. Exactly. So that's totally automatable. Automatable. If, if that's a word in English, you can uh, take every object and switch everything with the object if you like. If you find something inconsistent, let me know. Christian, would you like to force us to finish or do we have like a bit five minutes probably? Okay, you, you don't force us to finish. Uh, guys, if you don't have to leave, I propose we'd stay for another five to 10 minutes, answer the questions and then we'll leave. Is it okay for you? Perfect, I appreciate your time. So let's go further. Mm, when is the next discussion on Archimate? I leave that without answer. <laughs> we just take it that you want it. That's, that's really important. We'll try to arrange that. Actually, the Incosi as a community tries to make the uh, collaboration between different communities. And the fact that we have this webinar and the voting uh, is a signal to guys who are responsible for that in the Incosi community. So we definitely will try to merge it. Um, yeah. Guys, if you find any question you want to answer, gladly. I'm just looking through the window. That's a very hard one. Somebody asks, how is enterprise architecture different from system or systems engineering? Um, would you? Shall I? Uh, if, you, if you go first, I go after. That's easier for me. <laughs> yeah. Let me put it this way. Well, the orthodox way to describe uh, to describe system of systems is like uh, it's engineering of systems which are managed 
or developed by organizations which do not talk to each other. That's why system of systems. Actually, well, you can think every system is, uh, contains different systems. That's not the thing. The thing is why you have like special approach and special standards is if you have one organization which develops something and another organization which develops something, and at some point of time, it has to work together, but these organizations don't really speak to each other. And there is a organization on top of them which has to manage that somehow. That's for system of systems. In that sense, that's kind of a different viewpoint, I would say. No, enterprises can be seen as systems. That's what we systems engineers tend to do. And uh, sometimes, like big, huge enterprises, they have parts which do not really uh, exchange information. So in that sense, you can use system of systems approaches. What do you think, Herman? I think... Uh, thanks to the IT revolutions, our organizations have become so complicated that a top-down approach, right, where you can try to go to a higher level to kind of steer what's going on below is no longer feasible. And I think that a lot of the architecture actually emerges from what happens uh, uh, in other parts of the organization or organizations around you. That's why we also have a history of 50 years of kind of encapsulation, right? Trying to make things simple, have an encapsulation, try to partition. It's all a fight against that the whole together is, has become too complex. So we see that everywhere. We even see it in organizations. We used to have departments and product ma project managers. These days, we flexible humans are organized around IT. We have product managers and and, and, and product teams and et cetera, et cetera. So IT is very hard to change. People are very flexible. Uh, and that's kind of a turnaround we're seeing. And I see a lot of the architecture actually not coming from top down or steer top down, but there is a lot of kind of emerging architecture and a lot of kind of uh, collaboration. Um, and at some point it, it slows us down, right? So we encapsulate and we partition. Um, that keeps us somewhat going. Thank you. So yes, it's a system of system, but you can design it top down. That's more or less the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basically the systems of systems approach. It's not the top down thing. You cannot really manage it the top down way. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, guys, you're free to catch a question. I'm just trying to document every question in the in the Q&A session, just to make sure we will answer them after the session. What is the relation in enterprise architecture and software architecture? Somebody wants to answer that? The more of our organizations become coded in IT, the more of enterprise architecture is actually expressed as software architecture. And if you have an organization which is largely only doing bits like we are, because pensions, that's kind of bits, then our enterprise architecture is extremely dependent on our software architecture. Very closely related. But enterprise architecture is more than software. Yes. It's the bigger picture. Read the books of Tom Graves if you want to know more about that. Okay. Good call. Let me try this one. I am trying to build a model of our process model at my company using Rhapsody. Why should I switch to Archimate? Um, well, I never said that you should. <laughs> I mean, let, let me give a short comment and you guys, I really appreciate your comments on that as well. I, I would say again, it has to be meaningful. If your colleagues understand what you're doing in Rhapsody, if, you, if it helps you to change the real world at the end of the day then you don't have to it's perfectly fine um if you if you if you see that you can change the reality better or 
explain your colleagues what's happening in your model uh, with Archimate, not with Rhapsody uh, environment, then do it. I think that's the guided guiding reason for that would have been a guiding reason for me. I have I have to go. Good. Okay. I think that's that's the that's the call, guys. Again, I really appreciate that. Thanks for being there. I'll reach out to you, and uh, all of those ones who asked the questions and didn't get the answer, I screenshotted all of them in case Zoom doesn't record that, and we'll reach to you. Thank you, Phil, Herben, Christian. Good. Thank Good you, luck. everyone else. Yeah. Good luck, all of you. I appreciate that. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good night and good luck. <laughs> yeah, see ya.